Hello and welcome to Class Class, where we have a class about a class. Topic of the day today is sorcerers and how they differ from wizards and other spellcasters. What are the benefits of being a sorcerer as, you know, as opposed to a wizard or a cleric or a druid? Any other kind of magic user, what do they bring to the table? Well, I've got 3.5's uh, Player's Handbook in front of me. I've got Pathfinder, 4th edition, 5th edition, all jumbled around in my head. And just the general themes that go with a sorcerer. And I thought we could talk about that today. Now, rule number one about sorcerers is that they are not uh, studious spellcasters. They don't have to. Uh, they don't have to pray to a god like clerics. They don't have to prepare their spells like wizards. They are all about the innate talent and the um, the raw emotion, the raw power. Like me and my friends used to joke, if uh, if an anime, if if one of the uh, core classes was going to be an anime character, you would have to pick the sorcerer because he's all about the passion and summoning up, you know, the human spirit and. And you know, projecting that out his hands as as fire or lightning or whatever the occasion happens to call for, because anime is really dramatic and based on human emotion and music and song and all that dance that goes with that. But sorcerers, um, unlike their scholarly counterparts, are all based on um, innate talents. That when they reach puberty, they start they start noticing different things like some households might think they're haunted because they have like flashing lights and weird sounds and different things throughout could be uh, an emerging sorcerer one of your children things like that and you know sorcerers don't really go to school they don't congregate you know they don't really there's nothing for them to share they can have like a, an older sorcerer looking out for them to help like help train their gifts, but mostly it's it's inborn, it's innate. It's something that they have to grasp for themselves um, because of their bloodline, because of where they come from. Now, Pathfinder covers it better than D&D &D ever did, but at least in Pathfinder, when you're making a sorcerer, you have to decide where your magic talent comes from, and that means choosing a bloodline. So, you know, was do you have a dragon ancestor? Do you have a demon uh, ancestor? Do you you know was there some druidic stuff going on a few generations back? D and D uh, alludes to dragons more than anything. Yeah, some sorcerers claim that the blood of dragons courses through their veins, and different things like that. There has to be something potent and powerful somewhere in your lineage that would attribute to the fact that you can just throw magic around without any training. Um, and that's half the fun of making a sorcerer to, to a lot of people is deciding on a bloodline in like Pathfinder because Pathfinder has dozens and dozens of bloodlines. There's angelic, demonic, abysmal, draconic, um, aquatic, uh, Freaking, I, I can't even think of, there, there's fancy names for all different ones, plant life, uh, sun gods, you know, lesser aberrations, you know, beings from other planes of existence that just decided to jump over here and get it on with somebody, <laughs> different things like that. And choosing a bloodline in Pathfinder will actually affect the spells that you receive um, as part of your innate sorcerer talents. But in D and D, um, they usually just go with dragons because that's the best they've got. And I'm sure there's other stuff relating to bloodline in some of the other books, but I just have the core one in front of me. So at some point in your family lineage, there was some hanky pank going on between one of your ancestors and a potent magical being. And when you're making a sorcerer, that's probably the best starting point for you. Is you know, is it a dragon? Is it a demon? Is it a you know? A Silvari elf, you know what is. What's what's the starting point? And if you do that, that's the great jumping off point to decide what kind of sorcerer you have. Because sorcerers are often um, beautiful. They're they're exotic looking, but you can't quite place where it comes from. You know, are they 
they're really great looking in the face. You know, they have able, they're able-bodied, they're rarely like weak and sickly because they've got this potent magic blood in their veins. And because of this, you know, all of their stuff bases off of charisma. Now, just like the wizard, you know, they can't wear armor without spell failure, but all of their spells and other and um, tricks and doodads come from charisma. So if you've got, you know, a uh, uh, charisma of 11, it's not going to do you much good. You're going to have level 0 and level 1 spells at your disposal. So every 1 over 10 will give you access to that level of spell. So if you have an 18 in charisma and you want to be a sorcerer, you'll be set for life. Not only will you get extra spells and extra spells per day, but you'll have the capacity to cast them. Now, as far as spells for day and things like that go for sorcerers, um, how to put this? Sorcerers get fewer spells, but can cast the spells they have more often. So, like, in comparison, say a sorcerer could cast Fireball six times a day, just as an average. Uh, a wizard would be able to cast Fireball three times a day, and then, you know, Mage Hand, Lightning Bolt, and something else. That would be his six spells. Whereas a sorcerer, they, they really don't get a lot of picks. Like when they first start, I think there's only like four level zero spells, two level one spells. And you know, they can only change what spells they have uh, every two levels, which can be a long time or, you know, not happen at all. If you've got a campaign that runs from like level six to level nine, you're stuck, you know? So whatever you pick, make sure you pick it well, because it's not going to change anytime soon. It's not like you've got a spell book like a sorcerer, or like a wizard, sorry, where you can just study a different loadout of spells every day. You've just got the spells you know in front of you, and that's all. And sorcerers, you know, people that want to play magic users but don't want to, like, prepare a loadout of spells every day, whether it be for a cleric or a druid or what have you, play as a sorcerer because... The few spells that they know, they can just cast off the cuff. They don't have to think about them. They don't have to sit and study. They don't have to pray. They just have it. It's innate. You know, that's their talent. That's their thing. So, you know, you might only have six spells, but you can cast them a lot more often than other people can cast their magic. So you've got more bullets, but fewer guns. That's, that's probably a good way to put it. More bullets, but fewer guns. So... Um, what else? Sorcerers, sorcerers in general, gosh, they get a high will save. I think their will save tops out at plus 12, so really, really nice. They get familiars. Now, familiars are not like, uh, druid animal companions or like the hunter's, uh, animal companion. They're relatively small, so it's like a rat, a snake, a bat, uh, there's, there's a list here cat, lizard, owl, and they'll provide like a plus two to something for you. The ones that I see most often are the lizard and the, um, the bat. Be oh, no, they give plus, plus threes. Okay, so, like the bat gives a plus three to listen checks, and the lizard gives a plus three to climb checks. So you might pick a familiar based entirely on what skill you want a plus three in, but you do have to take care of your familiar because it takes um, 24 hours and X amount of gold to summon a familiar. And if your familiar dies, you know, if you send them, if you try to send them into battle, God forbid, or if you, if they get crushed or if they starve or whatever happens to them and they die, you have to wait a year and one day to get a new familiar. You are more likely to resurrect your old one than you are to get a new one because you have to wait a year to get a new familiar. So take damn good care of your familiar if you're a sorcerer because when they die, they're gone and you can't get another one anytime soon outside of a freaking resurrection spell and that's not a not something that happens very often. Um, let's see. In fact, there was something funny in here under familiars. Yeah, yeah, listen to this. Does this sound weird to you? Uh, a slain familiar can be raised from the dead just as a character can be, 
and does not lose a level or a constitution point when this happy event occurs. It's just, it just sounds weird to me. I don't know. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're on the same hit die as a wizard. They get a D4, any alignment they want, any religion they want. Um, their intelligence, like everybody else, is what they get their skill points off of. It's two plus their intelligence, so not a whole lot. But given you're a magic user that doesn't rely on scholarly pursuits, you know, a lot of book learning isn't going to help you unless you're specializing into something. Um, you know, and it's the druid's job to change the weather, and it's the wizard's job to stop the plagues and different things like that. So a sorcerer can be any number of things. I've seen several sorcerers just in my time play in D&D and Pathfinder and stuff. A lot of them that play like uh, street magicians where they'll just go and stand on the street corner and like put their hat down and like set up a little sign and just do like cantrips and like flashy kind of spells to to amuse the crowd and they, they make money that way and that's how they've they've kind of made their way in society basically as like a gleeman where they tell stories and they you know they they put smoke up in the air and they change the smoke into the shape of a dragon and a knight fighting each other and you know they've got fireworks shooting out of their hands and different things like that just trying to get by in society because you know, even, like I said, even up through, like, puberty, where they didn't know what was going on before they, like, manifested as a sorcerer, um, a lot of drama, a lot of, like, sh society shunning and family misunderstanding things that go on. A sorcerer can have a really rough life starting out before they, re A, realize what they are, and B, learn to control it, because there's, uh, again, sorcerers don't really congregate for anything. You can't really get together and write a manual on an innate talent like this that's based in your blood. Like somebody with a draconic bloodline isn't going to be able to compare notes with somebody who's got, you know, a, a, a water nymph in their bloodline. You know, that's two completely different branches of magic, especially if you go up through Pathfinder. Um, in Pathfinder, I think it's like every other level or every three levels you'll get a spell that pertains to your bloodline. So um, if you have a draconic bloodline, you'll, you'll get like, you'll get a breath weapon eventually. You'll get a uh, harder skin. You'll get, um, what are they called? Claws, God. You can manifest claws for a short time. If you're verdant, which is plant life, I believe, you can, you know, shoot vines out of your hands and swing like Spider-Man. You can turn into a tree and soak up sunlight to, to heal your wounds, you know. Pathfinder goes really, really well into sorcerers, uh, like, flavoring themselves with their bloodlines. So, as far as getting, like, the maximum cool experience, if you're, if you're going to play a sorcerer, I would definitely go with Pathfinder over D&D. And yeah, I know there's books and books and books of stuff, but just on personal experience, that's my thing, is that in Pathfinder, you, you pick the bloodline, and the bloodline will give you, like, over time, as you're leveling up, will give you six or eight spells, like, every, every few levels. You'll unlock, like, some of your ancestors' potential within your blood, and you can do cool stuff based on what your bloodline was, which I think is super cool, which is a great way to A, build your background, B, uh, theme yourself as a character, and C, uh, kind of know where you're going as, a, as like projecting forward, because sometimes people build characters who are like, oh, I'm built for combat, oh, I'm built for, you know, I'm the face man, I'm talking to people, or I'm built for healing, and you know, they, they do these really broad kind of things, but if you're playing like as a verdant sorcerer, I hope that's the right word. Uh, if you're playing as a verdant sorcerer, you know you you become closer and closer with nature. You would probably make friends with druids. You could talk to trees, you know, swing on vines. You can look forward to all these cool powers that you're going to get because you're going to become um, not more plant-like, but basically more plant-like in terms of powers as you go forward and you can look forward to all these great things that are going to happen to you over time and kind of plan for them. So, 
I don't know, it's, it's, it's hard to tell you the different types of sorcerers because A, Pathfinder, they're based on Bloodline. In D&D, they're really no different than Wizards in terms of theming that I've seen. There's, there's the, the raw damage dealer that's doing Fireball and Lightning Bolt. There's the, um, the utility sorcerer who's doing Mage Hand, Mend, Spider Climb, Fly, etc. If it's broken, he can fix it, or if we need a tool for this, he's got it. Um, which, to be honest, a rogue could probably do better than you beyond, like, third or fourth level. So, sometimes building a utility magic user is, is if you don't have a rogue in the party. And then the last one was, was just the, uh, the oddballs that, that go for something weird, which is usually good to go with if you have a bloodline, but in D&D, not so much. So, theme and building-wise, they're almost indistinguishable from wizards. The only thing that's any different is the mechanics on which they are built. So, if you want to build a wizenly old scholar or, or a, you know, a young, beautiful scholar that, you know, she can pull such secrets out of all these books and she's always looking for the next page to write into her spell tome, that's a wizard. But if you want to maybe have some, you know, family drama, uh, uh, kind of on the run from the law, maybe you you don't know a lot about your ancestry, you're trying to find your family, you've got all these innate talents that you're just learning to control, things like that, that's a sorcerer. So, in my opinion, uh, wizards will eventually, like, outstrip sorcerers, if only because they reach into the highest e echelons of magic, but sorcerers would probably kill them first. And I, 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 I guess, you know, like sorcerer versus wizard, a sorcerer is going to win. Just in my opinion. Because, A, the wizard has to sit and study, so if they suddenly decide to fight, then the sorcerer is just like, boom, fireball. <laughs> or if they've got a day to prepare for a duel, then the sorcerer can spend all of his time preparing defensively, whereas the wizard has to prepare offense and defense. So... The wizard eventually becomes more powerful and, like, godlike, just reaching into, you know, ninth level magic, 10th level magic at the very, very end game. A sorcerer will be useful over a longer period of time, even if he has fewer tools in his toolbox. So it's it's kind of the trade-off. You'll get in a more you'll get a more immediate kill as a as a sorcerer. But the further eventuality is that the wizard is would win in the long run. So, however you like to put that, the 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 early game for a sorcerer sucks just as much as a wizard. You got to wait until that second or third level to get your first damaging spell that doesn't suck. The mid game goes great, and then sorcerers kind of level out in in end game as far as like level fifteen on up because that's where the wizards just start straight up and out, uh, outstripping them. So, depends on what phase of the game you really want to be super effective in, or if, or whatever, if your campaign stretches from 7 to 12, you would want to be a sorcerer. But if it goes from like 12 to 17, then you'd want to be a wizard. So, um, keep an eye on, on your, your campaign span estimations, figure out what kind of person, what kind of character you want to be, to kind of make the distinction, you know, would this person be better as a wizard? Can you see that person sitting there reading for several hours a day, every day, with a different spell loadout? Or, you know, does this person come across as arrogant because they're so talented at throwing fireworks and wowing the crowd and things like that? Figure out what kind of person this is um, when choosing between the two, because... The sorcerer will lead the more interesting life, but the wizard will be far more powerful for it. So, that is that is not only an aesthetic choice, but just based on what you want out of the character, rather than out of all the crunchy rules. So, I've already done a, a, a video on wizards, so I don't want to overlap too much. I feel like this hasn't been a very long video, but... You can go watch my class class of wizards to talk more about the straight up spellcasters. 
and I will see you guys on the next class class. So until then, keep gaming.